Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depending on where you sit. Welcome. Welcome to this SME Strategy Live webinar, Leading Through Change Resistance. So great to see so many of you here. We've still got people trickling in, and we're just going to give them another minute or two as people arrive. Um, and as people arrive, uh, we would love to hear from you all about where you are, who you are, um, and where in the world you are. So um, if you don't mind dropping into the chat for everyone, introduce yourself. Um, say, hey, say who you are, say where you are. If you want to share your role, please do. Uh, but one of the biggest reasons we uh, put on these webinars is to connect professionals to each other. And so um, let's make some good connections while we're here. That's the most one of the most exciting parts. We've still got some other people coming in. So if you're just joining us, who are you and where are you? I'll pop those questions into the chat. Cynthia, welcome from Eastern Canada. Welcome, Nawaf. I hope I said that correctly from Saudi Arabia and Donald, Texas. I was just down there. I was just down in Texas. It was hot. All right. Ohio, San Diego, Austin. So many good, great locations. Some I've never been to. I need to get to. Don't miss the Victoria one. <laughs> The Victoria location of SME strategy as well. I'm actually, um, just to give you a quick introduction on myself as we go here, uh, get ready to get started here with the webinar. Um, please keep dropping your intros into the chat. But by way of introduction, my name is Jen Skumachi. I am a senior facilitator at SME strategy. Hello, welcome Kimberly, welcome Linda, welcome Dr. Claude, welcome everybody. Um, I am domiciled in the greater Boston location of uh, SME strategy strategy. And, and uh, we have an office in Vancouver. And I'm so, so, so excited today to share with you all uh, uh, the person, one of the people who sits out in our Victoria office, and that's Jenna Sedmack. Uh, she is here today. She's our chief client officer and senior facilitator. And I am going to uh, turn this webinar over to her uh, in just a minute here so she can get started. Uh, and she is going to talk with you today about leading through change resistance. And when she wraps up today, uh, I'm going to come back on and tell you all a little bit more about SME's SME Strategies Strategy and Leadership Community, uh, which is a newly launched initiative, uh, or re I should say relaunched initiative uh, from our team to connect you all to reach each other to keep these conversations going. So we're so excited you're here. Please continue uh, dropping your names, locations, introductions into the chat. If you have questions at all throughout the webinar, please also pop those in the chat. I'll be monitoring them. Again, my name is Jen Skumachi. I'm with SME Strategy in our Greater Boston office, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today. Uh, I now will turn the floor over to our Chief Client Officer and Senior Facilitator, Jenna Sedmack. All right. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everyone. Nice to see so many of you here today from different locations around the world. Uh, as Jen mentioned, I'll be walking us through a discussion around leading through change resistance. Um, before I do that, I'll give you just a really quick introduction to who I am, a little bit about my background. And then, um, Jen, I think you've introduced SME strategy really well, so I'll probably just jump right into the topic. Um, so my name, of course, is Jenna Sedmak. As Jen mentioned, I'm the senior facilitator and chief client officer at SME strategy. I've been with the organization for actually 10 years now. Um, I personally reside in the View Royal neighborhood in Victoria, British Columbia, if anyone is familiar with that area. And I love to recognize and respect that I live on the traditional lands of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. Uh, my academic background is a Master of Arts in Intercultural International Communication, and then I've got additional certifications in organizational change and innovation, facilitation, and adult learning best practices. I think that's everything. I mean, a little bit fun, a little bit of fun stuff about myself. I really love drinking coffee. I like to go hiking, explore the local geography here in Victoria, BC. For any of you who have been up to British Columbia in Canada, great location to spend some time in nature. So Jen, give a little overview about who we are at SME Strategy. Um, ultimately, our purpose here is to um, connect you all today 
um, in our day-to-day -day work, we help organizations work through developing and implementing their strategic plans. We facilitate this and we provide executive coaching and learning opportunities throughout the life cycle of strategic plan development and strategic plan execution. So to kick us off, I'd love to just hear from your perspective around these questions. I'll launch the poll shortly. Um, but my three questions are, have you ever experienced change resistance yourself? This could be in your work life, your personal life, home. You know, have you ever experienced this feeling of resisting change or not wanting a change to happen? In your work life, have you ever noticed others resisting change, colleagues, those you lead? And then have you ever worked through a change at work um, that you've been involved with that's been difficult to execute or stick due to either resistance or lack of buy-in? And so I'm going to launch this right now. Bear with me for a moment. Um, there we go. So I'm launching the poll and I'd love to hear your perspectives if everyone can take a moment and answer these questions just to get a gauge of where we're at. So I'm watching the answers come in. Um, as I see here, I've got a hundred percent yes so far for have you ever experienced change resistance? Um, yourself, and then around 95% for have you ever experienced it um, with others in the workplace, and 5% unsure. And then has it ever been difficult for a change to stick? Again, 95% yes, and 5% unsure. So I'll leave this up for a moment, uh, but what it's looking like to me is this is a familiar feeling that most of us have had, either in ourselves, with others, or, you know, a combination of both. So I'll leave this up for just another 30 seconds. For those who are joining us right now, I've launched a poll and there are three questions. Have you ever experienced change resistance yourself? Have you ever noticed it in others? And have you ever had difficulty with the change being executed or sticking? All right, great. A few more answers coming in. So. I'll, I'll close the poll shortly, but uh, share that, yeah, 100% of you, every single person that has answered the poll says, yes, they have experienced change resistance themselves. A resounding 95%, yes, they've noticed it in others and 5% unsure. And then 95% have had difficulty um, executing a change due to resistance or buy lack of buy-in. So um, it sounds like it's a feeling that you're all familiar with to at least some extent. I'm going to share the results so you can see that for yourself. Take a quick peek and then we'll dive right into the content for today. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing and dig in. So I'll reiterate some of the goals for today's session. Jen mentioned them already, but connect you to each other. Uh, as much as we're sharing information, we also respect the wisdom in the room. All of you bring in such great perspectives and ideas from your different careers, experiences, education, and so forth. So giving you the opportunity not only to learn from us, but to learn and connect with each other. Uh, we're going to hopefully challenge how you think about the topic of change resistance, present a little bit of a different paradigm for how to view this perspective and you know, view the phenomenon of resistance to change. Uh, and then we're going to introduce a few tactics for how to effectively lead people through change during that period of resistance and hopefully reducing it. I'd love to take a moment to reflect on why I feel this topic is important. Um, due to, based on some research and you know, due to different academic and professional perspectives, there's a variety of different studies um, some of them arguing up to 93% of change initiatives either fail or just don't stick over the long term. Now, there's a little bit of discrepancy in these studies. You know, that's quite a range. 93 is at the top end and some lower. Now, even though there's this variation between these different studies, overall experts tend to agree, whether professional or academic, that roughly 70%, if we look at the average, 70% of these changes tend to fail. So that's really high from my perspective. That's a lot of time, energy, effort, money put into initiatives that probably won't be completed or stick over the long term. So there's many reasons that can lead to failure of change implementation, but 
primarily it stems from focusing on the process of change over the people involved in the change. People are at the heart of any change and looking at, you know, the resistance, the psychological side of change, that's really, really important alongside looking at change management processes. And so other reasons why it's important looking at the positive side of the coin, when we're reducing that resistance, if we're proactively addressing it, um, and there's alignment around why are we doing this change, we'll li more likely get more buy-in, you know, top down, laterally, throughout the entire organization. And then if there's focus, attention, and care around those individuals, teams, groups who are involved with the change, or even just impacted by, or not even just, or even impacted by the change, um, my hope is that there will be a reduction in fear and greater clarity around how people can move forward. Often um, resistance to change, there's some element of fear or uncertainty uh, that kind of nestles its way in there and can perpetuate it a little bit further. Ultimately, aligned, aligned teams perform better. They often have more engagement and less friction over the long term. It's not a panacea, a one size fits all. Um, but the more we work towards team alignment as leaders, the better engagement we will see and hopefully less and less change resistance over time. I'd love to take a moment to identify a few types of change. Now, this is not every single specific type of change an organization might encounter, but these are kind of buckets of types of change that could occur. And I've split them into planned and unplanned change, just to get a definition for what we're looking at here. So plan change, these are typically parts of an organization's strategic plan. So something we're planning for, let's say two to five years in advance, um, or specific projects or initiatives that are developed within the scope of strategic goals and outcomes. So we're really intentionally planning these and looking forward to do these. So they could be incremental, something that's a slow integration, maybe one department at a time. An example of this we often see is maybe a new software rollout. Uh, it could be done through individual teams. There could be some beta tests, iron out some kinks in the process, and then roll it out to another team slowly over time. There is also transformational change that can be part of a planned initiatives. And this typically either impacts a major function of the organization or the entire organization, um, the people at the processes, the systems, all of these interconnected. So there's many examples of this, but a merger and acquisition is a, a really big example of a transformational change that an organization might face. There's also unplanned change. And this is typically reactionary in response to something in external um, trends or urgencies. Uh, one that we're probably all familiar with in the last four years is that online pivot during early stages of pandemic closures. It was a change that many organizations were faced with and did not plan for. Um, some organizations handled it really, really well and others not as well. So just keeping in mind that planned and unplanned element of change and then incremental and transformational. We won't go too deep into this today, but just wanted to set the stage for what types of change we might be looking at when we experience resistance. So if we have a lot of resistance around a change initiative, there are certain things that can go wrong, not limited to this list, but these are some issues we see in organizations we work with and also um, as replicated in several studies, both academic and professional. So duplicate work. If we don't have a plan in place and we don't have everyone bought in, we can see work being done uh, in multiple areas by multiple individuals who maybe aren't sure what to do, what to do next, who's doing what. There might be confusion around why. Why does this change need to happen? Or why is it happening now? And this can delay critical project work or lead to misunderstandings and some friction and really either slow it down or stop it in its tracks. If there's an unclear destination, which is a shared vision of an end result. So what does done look like? What does complete look like? How do we know when this change is finished or ready? So if there's that lack of clarity around this, people don't really know what's expected of me by when, and how do I know when we've done this change? If there's a lack of systems and processes to embed the change into daily operations, so even if we've worked to mitigate that resistance and we don't have a system in place to 
keep that alignment, both within people and processes, we might move back to previous ways of behaving and operating. And then a note I have at the bottom is to remember, um, just like buy-in and excitement can spread among team members, so can resistance. If you've got a lot of resistance internally and it's not um, discussed or worked through, it might spread. It's like that moldy peach at the bottom of a fruit bowl. If you leave it there long enough, that mold will sort of fester and spread to the other fruit. So just keeping in mind, um, ignoring change resistance can lead to the spread of change resistance to people who might otherwise not resist. So before we go into looking at this a little bit deeper, talking about some mitigation tactics, looking at the psychology behind resistance to change, I'd love to get some of your perspectives in the chat um, and engage some of this great wisdom we have in the room here. Um, from your perspective, if you have a lot of resistance to change, how might this negatively impact an initiative? What experiences do you have? What have you read about? Anything that you'd like to share, please do in the chat. And I'll give you about two minutes to share some ideas here. People will go underground, create toxicity around the change. Culture tends to be tested, spread of misinformation, causing roadblocks in projects. Yeah, these are all great examples. Referent leaders squash the idea, stall plans, hurts quality of results, can halt the initiative or progress. It can impact donors, interest of the overall mission. Yeah. Great. I'll keep the chat open for a few more minutes, or rather the chat is open continually, but I'll keep this question up on the screen for the chat. Lots of great perspectives. All right, so if anyone still has any lingering ideas, please do feel free to share them in the chat. I will move on to our next slides and continue the conversation here. So I'd love to take a moment and define what is change resistance? We hear about it a lot. I think we all have a general idea of it, but I'd like to unpack that phrase a little bit deeper. So when I'm looking at change resistance uh, and also what the research shows is that it's, it's a reaction um, to an existing or upcoming change that might impact a person's work, role, responsibilities, et cetera. So when we're looking at it in the workplace, that's how we're defining it. Um, typically, it's, it is a fear or unwillingness, as well as reluctance to adopt a change. Uh, important to note that um, not all change resistance is outward. We may not know when someone ex is experiencing resistance to change. We may not see it. It may not be outwardly expressed. Now, it also may be. We may have people that are very vocal um, with expressing their concerns, but just recognizing that um, this can happen inwardly and outwardly. Um, this is one of the most important um, or significant factors looking at whether or not a change will be successfully implemented. And then bolded, highlighted at the bottom, where I wanted to challenge this paradigm is so many leaders we work with um, take a sort of sticks approach, um, you know, that sticks and carrots approach, uh, disciplinary approach to change resistance. Whereas I want to highlight that it's a normal psychological response. Change resistance should be expected within a certain percentage of people in an organization. It's going to affect many, if not most people, in, at least in some situation in life. And as we saw from our poll at the beginning, 100% of us have experienced change resistance at some point. So I want to prepare leaders to expect change resistance and feel equipped to work through it proactively with their teams. So there's a few reasons why change resistance might occur. I'll talk first about dispositional reasons, and then I'll talk uh, a little bit further around communication and leadership reasons, which tend to be more impactful and ones we can work through proactively. So when we're looking at dispositional change resistance, this is typically developed internally within oneself. Um, it's outside of leadership control, but can also be worked through, discussed, and mitigated. So dispositional elements uh, refer to those individual levels of emotion and anxiety towards either change itself or the disruption of one's routine. So that feeling of anxiety and discomfort with an upcoming or existing change. Now, 
there is a tendency for some people um, to focus on immediate pains before or without reflecting on long-term benefits. And this is something that has affected me personally in situations and, you know, le- needing to take a step back and say, what's the long-term benefit versus the short-term pain? And as leaders, it can be really important to highlight this for people when they're experiencing this dispositional element around fear for change. Some individuals maybe tend to have inflexible or rigid perspectives and beliefs um, that lead to a reluctance to accept new information or ways of working. Um, again, leaders can appeal to this and really highlighting the why. What is the benefit? Why does that outweigh the pain of change? Um, and there might be a combination of the above dispositional elements. So an individual might experience all three of these. Now, just because someone has dispositional Um, tendencies towards change resistance doesn't mean they will resist every change. And so even more impactful reasons why change resistance might occur is if there are lack of communication or lack of leadership elements around the change initiative. So lack of early, and I want to highlight early here, two-way communication that considers the needs and perspectives of those who are implementing or are impacted by the change is something that can really lead to resistance. When people feel change is happening to them rather than with them, even if the change must occur, they're more likely to dig in their heels and resist. So bringing people along for the change, making them a part of the change, giving them an opportunity to voice concerns, um, share what they need to succeed can be a really impactful way for leaders to address that element of change resistance. There may be fear or uncertainty around whether the change itself can even be successful long term. Um, Will the individual be successful in their roles afterwards? Do they have the tools they need, the resources, the time they need, the support, help with addressing roadblocks? So all of those things might lead to fear and uncertainty as well, leading to resistance. So leaders taking the time to address some of these issues with people, you know, answering those questions making sure there are resources allocated, they will have the time they need, the support they need to execute this change and operate in this new world they're going to be operating in successfully can help to mitigate that as well. Um, Lack of trust in leaders or lack of trust in success of the initiative within the organization. So this can also be um, a critical factor. So if people don't trust the leader who's leading the change for a number of reasons, reasons, um, they may lose faith that this initiative itself can be successful. So building trust and communication, these soft skills that are discussed so often in business are such a critical piece of the puzzle alongside those hard skills for managing change. Um, And then just a quick note at the bottom here is that these two pieces, those dispositional elements and leadership and communication when combined can really snowball. So if you've got folks who are dispositionally um, disposed to change resistance and you've got some issues with communication and uncertainty, uh, this can really elevate the resistance to change very quickly. So now that we understand some of the dispositional elements, we know that we should accept and expect some level of resistance to change within a certain percentage of our workforce, I'd like to segue into how can we approach this as leaders and what are some tactics we can use? Um, So the leaders that we've spoken to and also backed with research uh, academically and professionally who tend to succeed with helping to reduce, mitigate change and successfully execute change initiatives Um, They understand and expect some level of this response. Um, They know that people will experience it and they recognize that it will spread if not addressed. So they have that sense of urgency around change resistance. I know it's going to happen. I expect it. And so it's my job to address this as a leader. Um, They have a readiness to prepare for and plan for change ahead of time and in a way that's going to build trust. So it's not taking the approach that this change has to happen and you must adhere to it. It's, I really want to do this collaboratively with people who are impacted by and affected by this change so that this happens with them rather than to them. So yes, the change needs to happen and I'm going to foster it in a way that's inclusive and it brings people along for the journey. Um, However, this takes time. 
And so the organizational leaders who best approach change have a willingness and understanding that we need to spend time on the front end to prepare for this change. If we just launch into the change and hope for success, it's going to take longer at the end. So there's a willingness to kind of front load some of this communication work to prepare adequately for this change, make sure there's that two-way communication, um, and then be prepared to make some adjustments and tweaks so that those who are impacted by the change really have a voice in how it is carried forward. Again, it's not to say that um, they don't have to make this change happen, like the change might genuinely need to happen, but allowing that space for those fears to be discussed and some resources to be allocated, some Q&A, and a deep understanding of why. Um, so often there's not clarity around why are we doing this in the first place? So making sure that those elements are met. Now, before we go into specific mitigation tactics, we've got five of them for you today. Um, I'm sure many of you have gone through some changes that were not done very well and some that have been done well or better than others. So I'd love to hear from you quickly. Think of a time there where a change was executed well and resistance was minimal. This can be in your personal life or your work life. Um, what do you think was done well, either by yourself or someone else to actually help this become um, fostered throughout the organization or within your home? Explain the why and communicate, communicate, communicate. Yeah, communication. I'll give a few minutes for others to share. Are there any specific things when you hear communication? Um, you know, was it one-on-one -on -one communication? Was it group communication? Anything specific that anyone wants to elaborate on would be wonderful. In changes that have been executed well with minimal resistance, what do you think was done well? Tell others what's in it for them. Yeah, absolutely. So often a change is beneficial for the organization and that's how the leaders focus on sharing the why. Here's how it's gonna benefit the organization, but they forget about discussing what's the benefit for the employees who are involved. How will it help them either make their job easier, make their life easier, maybe more opportunities for growth, development, et cetera. Communication number one in change management. Tell them what you don't know. Yeah, I missed that piece. That's great. Active listening and done with stakeholders, not just the few at the top. Connect the recipient to the message. Generalities do not work. Yeah, great, great examples. Brainstorming the benefits of change. Yeah, that's a fabulous idea, talking about it together. Same message spoken by top leaders. Great, yeah, that alignment and consistency. Fantastic. Um, communication, tell a story. Absolutely. Um, if people can't recall the reasons, how do they remember the why? That is great. Personal development program left lots of space for people to make choices on how to participate. Great specific example. I really like that. Great. Um, so if you have your hand raised, we're going to have an open Q and A at the end. Um, may I request um, that any questions right now are popped in the chat, but that said, at the end, we'll take some verbal Q and A if there's time, um, but really love the level of engagement. So I'm going to move on to some mitigation tactics here and then, um, you know, keep the chat rolling as you want to. And Jen will be monitoring this consistently as we work through the last piece of the workshop here. So I'll go through the five mitigation tactics and then we'll open up for a conversation as time allows. So change readiness. So many times, as I mentioned, leaders just launch into planning for the change and using you know, a change management framework, which is great and important, but they miss the step of change readiness assessment. So what leaders can do is start to do a little bit of internal research in the organization before a change unfolds. Um, what is the level of readiness and how does a leader know this? Well, starting to discuss with other leaders who's impacted by this change, who will be involved with this? Where do we as leaders think there's specific processes that are needed? Where do we see gaps in knowledge that exist? Where do we as leaders see potential roadblocks and obstacles? And then talking to those involved. Now that we've assessed this from a leadership perspective, going to those people who are impacted and involved and saying, where do you see processes needed? Where do you see gaps in knowledge? Where do you see roadblocks? Where do you see obstacles? And then bringing it back up to the leadership team, 
great. What do we need to make sure we're actually ready for this change to unfold? So before we even say this change is happening, we start to plant the seed and the idea and assess where are we ready, where are we not ready, and what needs to be put in place to make sure we are ready. So that can be done through a change readiness assessment. Now, change preparation can be done right after or this at the same time as change readiness. And so working through a readiness exercise, such as the five Ps, and I'll cover that at a high level shortly, this can really combine that change readiness and change preparation together. So the five Ps are project. So what is it that we're even doing? Define what this is and what success looks like. How do we know when we're done? How do we know what needs to happen? And then looking at the purpose. And this is really the why. Why are we doing this? Why didn't we do this before? Why are we doing this now? What are the benefits of this? And again, not just to the organization, but to those who are involved with it. How do these benefits outweigh the pain of change? Then we've got particulars. So these are the fine details. What are the milestones that we need to hit? What are the specific expectations we have? Any sort of particular elements around this change that we need to have happen over the course of the time period. People who are involved, to what extent, which different stakeholder groups do we have internally? Some of them will have a greater impact of this change, some of them lesser. Um, some of them might be more involved, some less so. And so mapping out specific stakeholders as much as possible, avoiding saying everyone in the organization, and really looking at the specific individuals or groups that will be impacted in different ways and start to devise a plan for how you will collaborate with them. And then the last of the five Ps is process um, or framework for actually uh, moving through that change. And so we'll get to that in one of these mitigation tactics. But what I want to highlight is so many organizations start here with process. They jump straight into the fifth of the five Ps, um, but don't work through change readiness and change preparation. So project, purpose, particulars, people, talking about that at the leadership level, and then down to those who are involved with or impacted by it, and then back up and making iterations. And so we're, through this, we're assessing individual needs, organizational needs, and potentially departmental needs as a part of this process. Communication. Now, this is a third tactic, but this is kind of done from the beginning right through to the end. So it by no means, you know, third in order, it happens at every phase, but communicate early and proactively. So many of you shared in the chat, those changes that were best executed from your perspective had elements of strong communication. Communication is so often looked at as a soft skill, but it is so, so critical to building alignment, building understanding, and building that trust so that people can buy into the change and successfully execute it. So proactive communication, early communication, continual communication, and reciprocal communication are all so critical for effective change execution. Um, a lot of times organizational leaders I've worked with have said, well, I've communicated through the whole process and people are still not buying in. And as we dig in a little bit deeper and look at some problem solving through this process, we find often that it wasn't reciprocal or two way. There was a lot of telling and not a lot of asking. So again, really focusing on that reciprocal two way communication with those who are involved with or impacted by the change. And then again, reiterating our last steps, consider that not just doing the five P's exercises with the leaders, but also bringing that down to the level of the stakeholders so that you have that fulsome needs assessment. You really understand what the people who are involved with the change need in order to be successful. Because we can only guess as leaders what people need and sometimes our lenses don't see the full picture. So chatting with those involved and really taking their perspective and feedback to heart. Now, selecting your framework is important. So don't do this first, but do this as a part of the fifth of your five Ps if you use that um, framework for change readiness and change assessment. So there's many change management frameworks you can use. You can also create your own as long as it considers both people and processes. Um, two that we really like are the Cotter model for change and the Prosy Edgar model for change. So the Cotter model is a little bit more process focused. It still really does a great job of considering the people involved, 
but it is applied as a process to the entire organization or change initiative. And so it takes leaders through an eight step process for how to work through change. Whereas Prosy Adcar, it is an individual approach. It's looking at individual levels or small team levels of awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement towards a change. So they can be used individually or even together. Um, there's not enough time to go into the nuances and details of these models, but it is something that we have a workshop around at SME Strategy. And you know, maybe in the future, we could consider doing a, a deeper webinar on this topic. But um, you know, some sort of selection of a framework to work through the change to help leaders guide the change um, that considers both people and process. If it's too people focused, you might lack a process to guide you through and make sure that, you know, you've dotted your I's, crossed your T's. Um, but if it's too process focused, uh, you might forget to have some of those human elements that are so important for understanding behavior and communication as it relates to change. The fifth mitigation tactics uh, focus on leadership skills and self-reflection. Um, so many leaders don't take the time to reflect on strengths and weaknesses. And as leaders, we all have strengths and we all have weaknesses. So as leaders taking a time to say, okay, I've got an upcoming change. What are my skills? Where can I do a really great job in leading this change? And where might I have weaknesses? And how can I either address those weaknesses or bring others on board who have the strengths that I don't have. Um, and you know, one of the pieces in the Cotter model is to build a guiding coalition, for example. And so in that step, leaders can say, where do I have skills? Where do I have gaps? Who can I bring on board that don't have the same gaps that I need so we can complement each other? Um, so really having that self-awareness around our strengths and weaknesses is a key starting point here. Um, our ability to solicit feedback Things like, you know, 360 reviews, for example, sometimes we don't know what our strengths and weaknesses are and hearing from others can really help us get that understanding as well. Um, developing the ability to delegate and share work, especially when we don't have an area of strength, building that guiding coalition can really help to bring others into that vision for change and engage other leaders. So again, we've got um, lots of workshops on these various topics and not a lot of time to dig in really, really deep to each of these five mitigation tactics. But I hope that this has given you as leaders a place to start in terms of reflecting on how can I start to work with people who are resisting change rather than using just a disciplinarian approach when I encounter change resistance, for example. So we've got about 15 minutes. If anyone would like to um, either raise your hand and come off um, mute to ask questions or ask questions in the chat, Jen, I'll get you to field the questions and you can just watch for the order they come in and I'm happy to answer them, but you can let me know which ones to address in which order. And as you're reflecting and thinking, I'll say it doesn't even have to just be questions. If you have something you'd really just like to share, that's fantastic too. If you have an experience with one of these tactics, a specific story that will highlight something that has been said, that's great too. If you simply want to share and start a conversation. What is the best way to get leaders to buy into a change management philosophy? Um, that is quite a wide scope of a question. I'd love to know a little bit more detail if possible. Kathy, do you mean like a, a specific process for managing change? Um, what, what specifically do you mean by buy into a change management philosophy? as a process to adopt and use. Um, I think it starts with like back to back to the why. Um, you know, if, let's hypothetically say you're a leader on a team, you individually feel that um, this is an important topic. It needs to be managed with both the people and process in mind. 
um, starting to share with other leaders why this is important. Share some of the data and background around how many um, changes fail. Just like I started the webinar with, um, you know, here's what can go wrong. And if we manage it correctly, here's what can go right. Ultimately, it's going to help our bottom line. It's going to um, increase the return on investment, um, decrease duplicate work, increase buy-in, and reduce the chance we're going to have to backtrack and do it all over again. So I think just like with managing change, and it's a little bit meta here, is highlighting the benefits, the risks, and reducing that pain of change. Uh, what is your approach when it is the leader or perceived leader as the single point of resistance? Uh, that's a really tricky one. And, you know, there's a, a lot of perspectives around this, but I think, um, you know, there, there are times when there's a leadership team and one of the leader is a single point of resistance. And it's going to be really, really difficult to cascade buy-in if you've got a leader who's resisting. Um, so there's a few different ways to look at this. Um, you know, one is working through some of these change mitigation tactics within the leadership team itself. So let's say you have an executive leadership team of, of six different C-suite leaders, five are bought in and one leader is resisting. Um, really working through that two-way communication, finding out why, seeing if you can address this. Um, now, sometimes this is an imperfect process, and we've worked with some organizations who have had to part ways, unfortunately, with a leader who is resisting change that is essential. Um, but oftentimes, working through the same process within an executive or senior leadership team can help to lead to that buy-in as well. Um, it, it depends on every single group. Uh, sometimes it helps to have a facilitator or a moderator come in and really dig into perspectives and uh, work through some of these things together. But again, imperfect process. I think focusing on two-way communication, asking why, and then sharing the why from the perspective of why is this important and how is it going to benefit us? Jen, do you have anything to add to that? I'd love to hear, you know, you're, you've got a lot of experience in this as well. Anything to add to what I've shared? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, nothing um, bigger, you know, um, to, to add to what you've, you've shared, but I do see some stuff in the chat happening that I think is just kind of a little bit more of an expansion. So I, I see Claude said, you know, it's important to involve um, stakeholders in the actual discussion about how to reduce change resistance, right? So not just engaging um, the leader and stakeholders and peers, as I also see in the chat as well, um, you know, in the change, but in the discussion of about how to mitigate change resistance, um, you know, involving them um, on that front end discussion and engaging them there. I think that's that's absolutely key. Um, and attending this session kind of gives you all the license to do that. Um, and say, you know, if you're participating in a in a change session, um, you know, coming up or an initiative coming up to sort of say, hey, well, I just went to this uh, webinar put on by SME Strategy. And um, one of the most key parts is to really involve people on the front end of mitigating resistance. Um, you know, so so um, hopefully the session will equip you with some ideas and thoughts about, um, you know, how to have that conversation on the front end. Yeah, great, Jen. What I'll, what I'll do, you know, since we have some time is at a, you know, highish level, not in too much detail, I'll go over some of the elements of the Cotter model, because I think that might help to sort of answer some of these questions. So whether the resistance is at a senior leadership level or somewhere else in the team, um, that preparation is really important, but then also working through a process. Jen, did you have an urgency to address before I go through this quickly? I just wanted to let you know that I did pop into the chat in case you missed it, Jenna, um, two different blogs that you also wrote about change management, as well as one that's more specifically about um, the difference between Cotter and Prasiadkar. So if anyone needs um, a visual representation or you want to refer back to um, what Jenna is talking about, those are in the chat for you, those links to those blogs as well. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Jen. So, you know, if you're using the Cotter model, um, Again, after doing a change readiness assessment and having two-way communication, which can, which can really go a long way, again, whether with leadership teams or with others involved in the change or impacted by the change, um, as a high-level overview, create a sense of urgency. Uh, some of you mentioned this in the chat as well, but how are we going to inspire people? What is the story we're telling? What is the aspiration? How can we excite people around the change? And this really does start with the leadership level. Um, 
getting that sense of why and why now, and also hearing about, you know, those who are saying, why not? Like, maybe let's not do it. Okay, why do you think that? How can we together build that sense of urgency? Build a guiding coalition is often the next step. And I mentioned that too with leaders, you know, addressing your own gaps in knowledge, ability, and skills, and then bringing others on board who can support that sense of urgency, that vision for change. And so if you have more people bought in, the one or two voices who are resisting are more likely to eventually buy in when they see others buying in. They say, okay, others see the benefit. Again, it's not always perfect. Uh, we are all humans at the end of the day and human beings are tricky creatures sometimes but the more time we spend on getting more and more people buying in it also spreads so just like that moldy fruit of resistance can spread so can alignment and so grabbing those folks who are really already almost bought in focusing our attention getting that guiding coalition built can go a really long way um, having a strategic vision so an end result, how is the future different from what it is like now? And how do we know when we're there? That can be really impactful, especially again at that leadership level. If you've got a leader resisting or really anyone resisting, if they know clearly how the future looks, um, if it's not ambiguous, there's more likely to be a buy-in. So many times when there's an executive leadership team member who's resisting, it's because they don't see clearly the end picture or the end result. So really making sure that there's clarity around what does finished look like? What does done look like? How is that current state different than today's current state? How are we operating more efficiently? How are our lives easier? How are our jobs easier? How, again, do we know when we're there? Um, I'll go through the next steps, you know, really quickly, but enlisting a volunteer army. So starting to bring other people in with that two-way communication beyond the leadership team, who else has bought in? Who else is really likely to be excited by this initiative and help rally their peers? So that again, it's not just one person driving the change, but a team of people. Remove barriers. So this is starting with that first phase of two-way communication. And it happens consistently throughout the project. So new barriers might arise. And as leaders, making sure to work with your people to address them. Um, remembering that resistance can pop up at any time. I think this is something we didn't um, look at in depth today, but you might get a lot of buy-in and alignment at the start of the change. And as it rolls out and things get a bit more difficult, people might sort of opt out or start to resist along the way. So generating short-term wins systemically is a really great place to start to say, what are we doing well? And where are we at in relation to this end vision um, to keep people motivated throughout and you know, lessen the risk of getting additional um, resistance throughout, making sure that you sustain the acceleration and have a process to institute change at the end are also two important steps in this model. So I won't go in any deeper, but I'll say if you're aiming to get leadership buy-in and team buy-in, start with communication, start with a change readiness assessment, start with finding out why some people might be resisting and seeing if there's barriers that can be addressed, removed, um, or worked through, and then select a process, either Cotter model, proxy ad car model, or a combination of both to work through the change. And again, remembering there might be a level of resistance that happens and it might not be mitigated overnight. It might be something that needs to be continually worked through uh, and it can be challenging and take time. How can a lower level employee effectively sail an innovative change initiative in an organization and get leaders to accept it? Wow, you know, this is um, such an interesting question. I think it depends on the organization. If an organization is um, focused on psychological safety, is maybe a, a, what is defined as a learning organization that has systems and processes that enable people to be creative and propose innovative ideas, it will be a lot easier for that employee. Um, if there's an organization where leaders are not necessarily fostering creativity and organization in their people, there's not a process for it, there's not support for it, it will be infinitely more challenging for employees. So I think, you know, a place to start is for individuals to have an understanding of change management um, so that when they propose ideas to a leader, they can highlight the why. You know, why do I think this is a good idea? What problem do I think this is solving? And what types of resources do I think we need to make this happen? 
Um, it can be an uphill battle in some organizations um, for employees to work through this. So ultimately, I hope more and more organizations adopt sort of a learning organization approach where they have systems, processes, and leadership um, that supports ideas from different levels. But uh, I think, you know, if everyone has a general understanding of some of these processes, hopefully they can influence change at whatever level they are at in the organization. All right. And Jen, did you want to select one more question for me to answer? I have, um, as I'm going through this, I'm not quite sure where we're at, if there are any more questions. No. Um, why don't we bounce over quickly to, um, do you keep asking your executive leaders the why if you're getting a non-answer? And asking? yes, we'll, we'll have that be our final question in this Q&A and then we'll start to wrap up. So thank you. Okay, I'm trying to make sure I understand the question. Do you keep asking your executive leaders the why if getting a non-answer? Um, so Camille, just to, I'll reiterate in my own words to make sure I understand or give you a chance to let me know if I'm misunderstanding. Um, you know, if you're going through proposing a change, you're sharing why from your perspective, and they're either resisting or uncertain, but not giving you a reason why, do you keep pushing? Do I understand your question correctly? Yes. Um, yeah, that's a tricky one. I think, yeah, um, to an extent, absolutely, because there's there's got to be a reason. There's sort of a five whys exercise that we like to challenge when we're doing executive coaching. When someone's having, you know, an issue, proposing an idea, encountering a problem, you know, why? And then sometimes you get an answer and it's very surface level. Okay, why? And digging five levels deep. No, this can be an incredibly frustrating exercise for some people. So, you know, making sure people know that it's coming. I'm going to ask you why a lot of times um, so that it doesn't create, you know, even further digging of the heels. But yeah, I think to a certain extent, there's always a reason why. There's anytime there's resistance, there's a deep reason why. And finding that out um, is going to be really critical. Now, Sometimes it might be, we might be asking in the wrong format. So anonymous surveys can be one way to start. If we're not getting answers, um, sometimes, you know, putting out an anonymous survey where people feel like, okay, I can give the answer without a voice attached to it. That might be a tactic we can try. Um, one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes people aren't feeling as comfortable to share their fears or resistance in front of a group of people. So sometimes one-on-one -on -one communication can be helpful. Sometimes one-on-one -on -one communication, people don't feel comfortable and they'd rather a group where they know one or two of their peers might back up their perspectives. So, you know, ultimately, I guess the answer I'm getting at is the more forums or opportunities to communicate in different ways to appeal to different communication styles, the better if we're looking at reducing or mitigating uh, fear of change. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately, if you've got someone who's digging in their heels and they're not saying why, keep working with them, try to find different ways to engage them and hear their perspectives in a way that they're comfortable with. Um, and again, sometimes some people just keep resisting and ultimately, you know, using the disciplinary approach is definitely not a first choice, but sometimes, you know, if all tactics are exhausted and there's one person who's just not buying in, it might be worth a, a deeper discussion around, you know, if you don't start to share why you're resisting and let me help you work through it, this might be the impact of X, Y, Z, for example, but definitely not starting with that approach from my perspective. Um, Jen, I will, um, stop answering questions and I'll turn it over to uh, the last couple of slides and just let me know when you'd like me to switch and I'll turn it to you to close us out today. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jenna. Um, such great information. And everyone, thank you so much for being with us today. As I said, uh, Jenna is a wealth of resources, uh, resource around uh, change management in general. Change resistance um, is one of the specifics in there, but um, there's a lot of great resources on our website. I'm going to pop that into the chat for you. Uh, and also I'm going to pop, pop into the chat uh, an invitation to join us in our strategy and leadership community. Um, this is a, sort of an 
intact group of professionals who come together online to be able to connect about all things strategy and leadership. Um, so you'll have access to us, uh, to SME strategy expert consultants on strategy and leadership, live events like this, as well as Q and A's and trainings that we'll be offering, um, curated contents like like think about Facebook, but for strategy and leadership specifically. So we're going out and finding um, some really excellent content and sharing it out on this channel. Um, just like Facebook, you can save items that you're interested in, you can share items you're interested in, and you can refer and bring people into the community as well um, to stay connected with them through um, posting or direct messages. And um, certainly. Um, you know, our, our goal here is to connect you to each other, to elevate, you know, raise all ships, uh, and also to um, just help you strengthen your network interactions and, um, you know, see, find more people who work uh, in, in uh, similar work as you and uh, share knowledge and experience and, and make great connections. Uh, so if this sounds interesting to you, please do join us. I put the link in the chat. Um, this is being offered free for a limited time. We eventually are going to be charging for it, but if you get in now, we'll um, get you free lifetime membership there. And uh, speaking of the benefits from the community, please also join us for our next live webinar. Uh, save the date. It's going to be Thursday, September 14th from 12 to 1 p.m. And we are going to be talking about how to effectively develop your organization's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Uh, and registration is live for that right now in the strategy and leadership community. Uh, and we will be um, sending out more information about that for anyone who's not a member. Um, also, no that we're going to post today's recording and the slides in our strategy and leadership community so you will have immediate access to that as a member uh, and if you choose not to join the community we will be sending that information out um, for your information next week uh, to you know apply in your work and share with your colleagues Thanks so much for being here today. Again, we are SME Strategy. We're so excited that we got to share this time with you. Uh, we look forward to staying connected with you and continuing the conversation on strategy and leadership. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.